Welcome to Bradford, a fascinating city, then and now. I'm here in Undercliff Cemetery, among the giant graves of the great and the good from the Victorian era, the worthies as they were known. And note, these were all men. But that doesn't mean to say that there weren't any influential women around at the time, because there were, but that's another story. This cemetery ranks alongside Highgate in London and the necropolis in Glasgow. And somewhere among these gravestones lies my great-grandfather, Samuel Rhodes. Join me on a time machine. I'm going to take you back to the time when Bradford was the world's textile capital, attracting wealth from all over the world. T.S. Eliot mentioned it in the wasteland as a silk hat on a Bradford millionaire. Are you ready? Stand up if you will. We're going to turn once anti-clockwise after three. One, two, three. Look which way you will. See huge tall chimneys pouring forth volleys of smoke, which when you're near is not very pleasant. But when seen from a distance is interesting enough. There cannot be fewer than 100 of these chimneys in Bradford. So said the Reverend Jonathan Glyde, Minister of Horton Lane Chapel. It's 1854, the year this cemetery opened. And at that time, there weren't many public parks in the city. So the people of Bradford used to come here and promenade. I think I'll have a little promenade right now. Follow me. Follow Polly. Along this grand avenue, flanked by tall tombstones, lie many mares, over 20 in fact. Alongside renowned architects Lockwood and Mawson, who built the Town Hall, the Wool Exchange, and the UNESCO World Heritage Village of Saltair down the valley. There's a surgeon's grave. There are mill owners' mausoleums. There's a comedian, Charles Rice, formerly of the Theatre Royal Bradford. Oh, look over there at that tall tombstone, one of the largest in the cemetery. Who does that belong to? A mayor? A mill owner? No, a fishmonger, William Sharp. Or was it Shark? <laughs> so now it's time to go down into the town. Let's pay a little visit to Little Germany. Follow me. Follow Polly. So now here we are in Little Germany, or New Germany as it was originally known, home to the grandest of the city's Victorian warehouses. But in 1800, all this was just fields. In the 1850s, Bradford is manufacturing worsters and silks that are highly popular on the continental markets. German wool merchants started to arrive here in the 1830s, wanted to expand and increase their piece of the action. So they start to build these elaborate warehouses on this steep slope to the southeast of the church within easy access of the newly built railway station and the canal. So they can store and sell their wares through their own private premises rather than through the exchanges. According to Professor Asa Briggs's book, Victorian Cities, Names like Bären, Flersheim, Forst, Gumpel, Hertz, Meyer, Schlesinger and Sichel can be found in Ibbotson's trade directory of 1845, jostling with the Bradleys, Briggses, Brooks, Whittakers, Wilkinsons and Wilsons. The warehouse district in Bradford becomes known as Little Germany. For now, I'd like to introduce you to some German wool barons. Sir Jacob Bärens, whose family mausoleum is in Undercliff Cemetery and whose company, the Behrens Group, is still operating today in Manchester. So alongside Behrens' successful business endeavours, which won him a knighthood from Queen Victoria, he also worked hard for the Bradford community. He paid for and built a new school, set up the Technical College. He was involved in setting up the Eye and Ear Hospital and the Bradford Chamber of Commerce. <laughs> and he was instrumental, no pun intended, in establishing the long association between Bradford and the Halle Orchestra. So Behrens Warehouse today is one of the largest warehouses in Little Germany and it's given over to apartments. So just across the road from Behrens Warehouse is Caspian Warehouse. Not of particular architectural interest, but what is of note here is who this mill was built for. 
Julius Delius, the father of one of our greatest classical composers, Frederick Delius. Who's actually born? Fritz, Theodore, Albert Delius. And he was known as Fritz until he was 40. Now Fritz, or Fred, didn't want to follow his father into the wool trade. And once he left Bradford, he rarely returned. Oh, but Mr. Bean's been. So whereas the majority of the buildings in Little Germany were built by Eli Milne of Milne and France, not Germany, these two stunners were built by Lockwood and Mawson, old favourites but newcomers on the block at the time and out to make an impression, me thinks, and they certainly achieved that. This grand building is the old American and Chinese warehouse, now Bradford Chamber of Commerce. And this building would not look out of place in Vienna. The Law Russell House. Frederick Lockwood was the great-grandfather of the actress Margaret Lockwood, she of the Lady Vanishes fame from Alfred Hitchcock. Now it's time for this lady to vanish for a while. Can you imagine the impact on Bradford when these two great temples to culture, art and commerce suddenly appear on the skyline in 1853? They would have been like superimposing modern-day skyscrapers. The Palazzo was originally built as the Milligan and Forbes warehouse. Robert Milligan was the first Lord Mayor of Bradford. But today, it's better known as the former headquarters of local newspaper, The Telegraph and Argus, from the 1920s until quite recently. And next door is St George's Hall. Now, at this time, there's great rivalry between neighbouring Leeds and Bradford. But Bradford was the first of the two to sponsor a handsome new public building. This will be the best-known concert hall building in England, boasted Samuel Smith, the Lord Mayor and Chief Instigator for St George's Hall. He claimed that this hall would not only meet the needs of the mercantile men of Bradford, but also of the operatives, who after attending the concerts here would return to their homes, elevated and refreshed, rising the next morning to their daily toil without headache and without regret. And these concerts actually overshadowed those of Leeds. In fact, this great hall led the way to the building of Leeds Town Hall. Originally, it had a seating capacity of three and a half thousand. And there are reports of 5,000 people being crammed in there. No health and safety then. There would have been people smoking. And originally, it would have been lit by gaslight. Today, it's one of the oldest concert halls in Europe. And it attracts top stand-up comedians to its wide and eclectic programme of events. Back in the day, Charles Dickens spoke here. And when Winston Churchill came here in 1910, his speech was interrupted by the suffragettes who had hidden underneath the platform. His visit ended in chaos. In the 1970s, it was big on the music scene. Rock giants, the Rolling Stones, Led Zeppelin, punk bands like The Clash all played here. And in the early 1970s, David Bowie played here. I wonder if he sang Suffragette City. Hmm. So the Bradford Wool Exchange, built in the elaborate Venetian Gothic style, such a significant building that its foundation stone was laid by the then Prime Minister, Lord Palmerston. Today, it's got to be one of the best bookshops in the country, Waterstones, with a lovely little coffee shop up the stairs. And now I'd like to introduce you to John Anthony Burnett. I must add, known as Tony, I must emphasise that. The Wool Exchange, a great building, and on change days, as they were known, it was a hive of activity. Every trader in Bradford turned up Mondays and Thursdays, and I had a particular column as a representative of a large company. A queue of traders, sellers, buyers, approached me and gave me the details of what their offers were on that day, the prices, delivery, etc. The, the contracts could be as high as over a million pounds by the shake of a hand and verbal only. There were so many characters, it's unbelievable thinking back. If I told you the tales that we encountered, quite unbelievable. Some are still alive. For this reason, I, they cannot be mentioned. Here is St Peter's house on the edge of Little Germany. 
It was originally built as the post office by architect Sir Henry Tanner, who also built the post offices in Leeds, Halifax and Harrogate. Today, it's the Carla Sangam Art Centre, an intercultural arts hub. Carla meaning arts and Sangam is a confluence. Carla Sangam was founded in the early 90s by Dr. Sripati Upadhyay, a consultant clinical psychologist who arrived in England from Malaysia in 1990. His aim was to bring diverse audiences and artists together, creating opportunities for South Asian artists to collaborate creatively with non-South Asian artists. Dr. Sripati is pictured here with his wife, Professor Gita Upadhyay, a medical doctor. And together they brought health and mental health related issues into their artistic and cultural work at Kala Sangam. This magnificent mill dominates the Bradford skyline from almost every vantage point. It was the largest silk mill in the world. But it was after a bitter strike here at this mill in late 1890 that the Independent Labour Party was formed in Bradford. The mill was built by the King of Velvet, Samuel Cunley Flister, first Baron Masham, who was born into considerable wealth in Carvley Old Hall in 1815. Lister made millions from his many patents, silk combing, wool combing and velvet looms. And velvet from this mill was used in the coronation for King George V. And it was used to make curtains in the White House. Lister becomes an extensive landowner. And he buys Javeau Abbey, the Midland estate, including the castle, and he buys extensively in India. Today, the mill is home to some super trendily designed apartments with some of the best views across the city, thanks to the specially designed rooftop pods by Urban Splash. And it's also home to the bold, cutting edge, world leading theatre company, Mind the Gap. So whichever way you leave Bradford, you'll soon come across open countryside, like these beautiful moors. There are several moors that lay close to the city, and this is Bailden Moor. Interestingly, the village of Bailden was originally known as Hope Town, and this is Hope Hill. And as we travel forward in time now to the 21st century, hope is something we certainly all need, and I have it. From here, we can look back down to Lister's Mill, and sweeping round across the moors, we come to High Withins and Haworth, home to the Bronte sisters. So it's time now to jump back on the time machine. We're going to travel forward to the 21st century. Stand up if you will and turn once clockwise this time. Are you ready? One, two, three. Welcome back to the 21st century. We're here in the Mughal Gardens in the award-winning Lister Park. Behind me, we've got the Cartwright Hall, home now to David Hockney's gallery and built thanks to a generous donation from Samuel Lister. And Lister actually lived in his family home for a while in this park before Cartwright Hall was built. There really is just so much to show you in and around Bradford. It's many beautiful parks, museums. We have the National Science and Media Museum in Bradford. It's independent quarter and it's historic quarters. And we've only just scratched the Victorian surface. There are many more stories to tell you, particularly those of influential women. So Bradford has many active art communities and hubs that work really fantastically well throughout the year, putting on festivals and art events for the people and the community. And I hope you will agree that Bradford really is a fascinating city.